Let's see. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me, Mr. Schlossberg? Please call me Julian, and how are you? Oh, one second. Sorry about that. Can, you, can you hear me, Vaughn? Hold on one second. All right, I heard you. That's I can't hear you. Something picking up. So can you hear me now? Yeah, I heard you before. Oh, perfect. So yeah. thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to speak with us. Um, I was researching your career, and I think you're you know you're an amazing, uh, amazing human being, and you've made some amazing strides and achievements in your in your line of work. And I'm just super excited to speak with you. Well, um, you're, you're very kind, and I'm pat fascinated from a guy from Ithaca up in Cornell when I was in Binghamton uh, at a, at a college at that time called Harper College. So I took my field trip, Vaughn, to uh, Ithaca to go to Cornell to visit because I wasn't as smart as you, so I couldn't get in there. <laughs> but I went there and there was a huge rock quarry, gigantic. And I went there and there was a little dog that was looked like it was lost and had no collar. And I was young enough and dumb enough to just pick it up and take it back to school with me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, back, that's that's back during the you know the civil war but it was a long <laughs> time ago anyhow so you're from the motor city eh yes i'm from detroit originally and um yes to say the least <laughs> well yeah I, where are you where are you living now um now i'm in los angeles but currently i'm in new york so i'm in oh. a live workspace yeah so we're in the bronx near fordham university we work with the, uh, the internship program there as well so um and then today we were actually dusting off an, uh, a freight delivered from fedex a uh, package from um a new motorbike company so we do a lot of things in the auto and you know moto world so we were um, actually with the technician and i was like oh my god i gotta go <laughs> <laughs> well i'm so I'm glad like, that i'm glad you remembered and uh, <laughs> here we <laughs> are and uh, uh i lived um i could actually almost walk to fordham university i grew up the other that's the east bronx and i was in the west bronx but uh it wasn't that much of a difference in those days right yeah now yeah. the east now this side of the bronx is you know, about Fordham is uh, Little Italy and some of the most amazing restaurants and, and really? bars. Yes, yes. So uh, um, a lot of, uh, um, Anthony Bourdain, before he um, left this world, he um, actually did a bunch of reviews. Um, I think it was called, uh, on, on a ton, he did a ton of specials about the Bronx and how the food and the culinary scene was exploding. So um, for us, because we do a lot of things in the food world too, I decided to um, to take a stab at it as well. So we've been we've been reviewing tons of restaurants out here, um, working with the Four Seasons in Tribeca, the Civilian Hotel in the Theater District, which gets me back to you. Uh -oh. in the theater world. <laughs> but I have to tell you that you are a man, a jack of all trades. I'm reading about you, and you're doing this, and you're doing that, and you're modeling, and you're doing. I mean, I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. No kidding. It's great, and that's what happens when you're the youngest of five. <laughs> all right. All right. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta make it. You gotta happen. do something because they're all doing something. You gotta find something different. <laughs> right. You gotta stand out because you know definitely youngest of uh five amazing siblings so speaking of which how did how, how was it like growing up as um julian if i may call you that mr Slosberg? Please, please, how, please. how was it like growing up uh, you know um as a young man and tell us a little bit about your experiences um on your on your journey as well well you know as i said uh joe i i Vaughn, rather i called you joe i know why too uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to start that one again take that one from the top all right <laughs> i grew up in the bronx uh and in those days there were neighborhoods in new york they really were you had your delicatessen and your cleaners and your you know your drug store and candy store and it was a it was a very uh, a family like uh, kind of area, and I grew up across the street from the Kingsbridge Armory. Now the Kingsbridge Armory is the largest armory in the world, and before they built the Javits Center and the Coliseum, all the motorboat shows, all the car shows, all mm -hmm. played there. But what also played there were rodeos. Can you imagine? 
<laughs> bucking Broncos, bucking Broncos, tying up heifers in the Bronx. I mean, come on. <laughs> and as a kid, I was nine or 10 years old. To be able to go and see a rodeo across the street was fantastic. And what happened, uh, Vaughn, was that they, the all the uh, guys who had their stores were given two free tickets for the opening show of whatever it was, the motorboat, the car, whatever new show. And I ran around and I said, could I have a couple of tickets? And they got to know me and they gave me the tickets. And then I went out and I sold them <laughs> in front of the armory. So that was my beginning in show business. <laughs> Scalping tickets, I guess. But here's the good news. Since I was nine or 10, and that was about 70 years ago, uh, the great news is that uh, the statute of limitations has run out. So I'm free. That's why I can tell you the story. Right, about scalping. But nowadays, we have, uh, you know, facial recognition, so you can't get away with that right now. That's right. That's <laughs> right. But I didn't have a beard then, so maybe I would have had a shot. Right. <laughs> so that's awesome. So how did, you, how did your love for the entertainment business come about? That, that spearheaded it, obviously, with the showmanship of the rodeo show. But how did it come about? Like, uh, did you, were you a young... I guess thespian, did you feel like you were, uh, uh, like, how did you fall into the world? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm old enough to have grown up with radio. And what radio did, Vaughn, that television could never do, is really stimulate the imagination. Because you're out on the prairie with the Lone Ranger, you're going down to a vault down steps, and people are, the door cre creaking open, scaring you. And you, you, know, you visualize, you get very uh, kind of caught up in it, as I did in radio. And then I was there for the advent of television. So when TV begins, you can't believe that in your home, you're able to see movies and sports, and you don't have to leave. And then, of course, at that point, the movie theaters and the movie business got knocked on their rear end because everybody was staying home. But I think it was the excitement of television and the imagination of radio that I said, I want to be part of this world. I don't know what part, but as you said, I tried an actor's life. And as the song goes, an actor's life for me, but uh, I couldn't take the rejection. I really didn't like being rejected. See, unlike you, I was the only child. I wasn't one of five. So I had plenty of attention. And what do you mean? You're turning me down? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but they did. <laughs> and so I said, well, this is definitely not for me. <laughs> right. But, but well, you know what happened? They used to have, it's amazing when you, you look back, as I have in the book, you know, I wrote this book, Try Not to Hold It Against Me, uh, A Producer's Life. And, and, and it forces you to go back in time. And I remembered that Perry Como, a very famous singer of the time, had a show every week, but they gave tickets to the dress rehearsal. So oh. I would run down, get the tickets for the dress rehearsal, watch the show, take the subway back to the Bronx and watch the show live to see what they changed. So my mother thought I was really ready for the asylum, I think. What a crazy thing for a kid to be doing. I think... The answer is I was kind of struck as young as real young. I just wanted to be part of it. I didn't know what part, but I wanted to be part of show business. And yeah, and it sounds like, uh, and you get to you had to check out the continuity, right? As a producer. That's right. I oh, I never thought of that. That's a good yeah, point. That's right. Yeah. I just yeah. thought I was looking for mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the continuity. You ain't know your script supervisor. You're absolutely then, right. Yeah, if you had been <laughs> by my side, you would have reminded me of what the hell I was doing. But I didn't know it at the time. So you so you went on to ABC. You were in the radio division, right? I was in the TV division. The TV ABC. division. Yeah. Uh, it was a strange time because there were only three networks. There was no pay cable. There was no basic cable. There was no streaming. My God, it sounds like I was with George Washington. But there was... None of those things were there. And I, my job, because ABC was the third, at that time, the real third network. CBS and NBC had everything. ABC was struggling. So if we had what would they call a preemption, if hypothetically Lyndon Johnson made a big speech and the regular programming was canceled, my job was not to give back the money to the sponsor of the show that got canceled, but do what they call a make good. 
find another slot, another place for it, rather than give the money back. So that's what I started in what's called preemptions and make goods. And it was an interesting thing because uh, all of a sudden ABC got hot. They got a show called Bewitched. They got a show called The Fugitive. All of a sudden, this little third network was really getting competitive. So it was an interesting time in the mid 60s. Do you do you recall any? Uh, by the way, Bewitched was one of my favorite shows. I think we all love Bewitched, even on even on um, heavy re uh, rerun and rotation. Um, it's Samantha, right? She twinkled her nose and she made things happen. Well, yeah, and also a pretty girl twitching their nose. I mean, what the hell? Right. And then with with um, when can you tell us one of the I guess one of the a story or an, 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 uh, a time that you had to use one of those May goods? Use one of those what? The, the May goods when the show when the show wasn't doing too well and you had to use a May good or a preemption. Oh, oh no, I really had very little to do with it. I was I came in at the end. I was, oh, okay, it, was it. it was an opening job. I was getting ninety dollars a week, and uh, I thought. If I could just get to $120 a week, I would have made it. <laughs> right. And in today's market, you buy a bag of chips. <laughs> <laughs> right. So fast forward, you're working with um, these, you know, you, you work, first of all, some of the shows and the actors and talent you work with are just a part of pop culture and pop history. Um, I noticed that you work with um, and you've done some things alongside of Steve Allen with Peter Fonda um, and then some of that. And then also, um, did you you produced uh, uh, either, uh, I guess, it was a docker series or a documentary at the time about Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas, right? I did. I did. Yeah, I was very proud of that because uh, what happened was. It was only on for three nights uh, in, in 1991, the fall of 1991. But. It went on sometimes till two, three in the morning. I had a job and I needed my sleep. So I couldn't see it all. And I, 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 did, I forgot about it. it. He got on, the Thomas got on the court. And uh, all of a sudden I said, you know, I'd like to look at that again. It was years later. So I went to a gigantic place called Video Shack on 49th and Broadway, no longer there, almost a block long, filled with every kind of, cassette, there was no DVDs. I saw over 22 shows for the OJ case, but nothing, not one Vaughn for Anita Hill and 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 I thought, and Clarence Thompson. I thought, well, that's ridiculous. I have to do a show uh, about it. I just do because there were so many things that we really didn't know. Uh, and I wanted to show many of them, which I which I did. I was lucky that I was friendly with a, a rather important activist named Gloria Steinem. And I called Gloria and I said, would you consider uh, writing and hosting a show about Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas? And she said she would if you if I produce it. And, and, I, and I said, of course I, I would. And she said, will you direct it? And I said, yes, I will. And then she said, okay, one more thing. I want you to know I'm pro Anita Hill. I said, no shock. This is not a shock. But I said, but let's try to at least be as fair as we can, uh, because there are, everybody has two sides. I mean, there's always two sides. But um, I have to say that I was with Anita Hill. I have to. I have to yeah. confess. Yeah, I have to say that as well. I was actually, um, as a child, I watched some of those specials and shows, and even some of the conferences they had about the um, about the whole case. I was just like. I was bewitched. <laughs> to say the least. Right. I like and the I way you bring in the early part of the show. <laughs> but I but I was like, I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. And then to this day, I think a lot of us we tend to forget, you know, that was a part, that was the Me Too beginning of the movie. Was. And you know, it was very interesting. I don't know if you know this, Vaughn, but in 1992, which was a few, you know, the next year, and remember, this is the fall of 91, it was called the Year of the Women. The oh. Year of the Women. 28 women were elected to Congress and the Senate, the biggest ever. And uh, a lot of people believe it was because of the backlash against the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas hearings where Thomas got in. So uh, it, it really started it all. And 
television had had never seen the likes of sexual harassment. I mean, this was hotter than any daytime soap opera. This was, was real. I mean, the language and what was being said was unheard of at that time. Yes, all of our mouths dropped. I remember I was watching it with my parents and I was like, what? He did what? It was just, yep. it, it was very, it was very, um, it was disturbing because it was so detailed. Anita was so detailed in her, you know, in her presentation of her, of, of what happened uh, to her, or, you know, her, you know, it was just, it was, it was, it was terrible to say the least. You know, we have, as we both know, we have a history in this country of a lot of things that we cannot be proud of. So that's another one as far as I'm concerned, but they'll call me a pinko. What do I care? All right. And then, and then you, and then you, 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 you never cease to amaze me. You keep going and you have all these other amazing um, milestones in your career. What was it like working with the Stephen Allen project? Well, Steve Allen was an incredible guy. Most people don't realize he started the tonight show long before Jimmy Fallon. He was the number one first guy. And then they came, then came Jack Parr, then Johnny Carson, of course, and we know how it keeps going. But he was the one who started it all. He took cameras out on the street. Very few people, if anyone did that, he was really a, a, a pioneer. And then he got, uh, they, he got hot and he got a Sunday night programming, eight o'clock Sunday night. Now, the reason they gave it to him was the guy who was killing him on, he was on NBC. The guy <laughs> killing, him, killing him on CBS was Ed Sullivan. Ed yeah. Sullivan was the man. So nobody wanted to go up against Ed Sullivan. Steve said he would. And he did a lot of shows and did reasonably well, even though Sullivan really was hard to beat. And I called him and I asked him if he had any of the Tonight Shows. He said, no, they destroyed most of them. He said, but I have the Sunday night show. I said, oh, great. I said, what well, would you like to want to work on that? He said, sure, let's do it. And that's what we did. Oh, I'll tell you, remember Don Knotts from uh, the Andy Griffith show? He, yeah. started, he started with Steve Allen. On nice. that show. Yeah, a lot of people did. So it was nice to work with him. We did two one hour specials and we played HBO and around the country. So it was nice working with him. I also worked with a guy from early television named Sid Caesar. And Sid Caesar and Emma Jean Coca had a show called Your Show of Shows. God, we see, keep saying show. Your Show of Shows. And uh, it was Sid Caesar, Emma Jean Coca, Carl Reiner. And uh, we, did, uh, we did a movie of that called 10 from Your Show of Shows. So it's interesting that, Vaughn, uh, you mentioned that why did it start? Those two shows were from my childhood, yet I ended up producing them, remembering them, and thinking, oh, maybe they'd be nice to bring back now. And so I did. And how did that make you feel to see your life go a 360 or full circle? Because that sounds amazing that, you know, I, you know, this young man that grew up in the Bronx went on to do TV and film, but not just in front of the camera, behind the camera. But how did that make you feel? Because wasn't that a full circle moment? Well, yes, it was. And on top of it, it's what I always wanted to do. I mean, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm fortunate, I have my friends for 40, 50, and 60 years, have them from high school and college, and even one from the first grade, which I think we should get the quad de guerre that we could stand each other for almost 80 years or so. But, but uh, yes, they said you always wanted to be in show. You always wanted it. So in a way, you know, they used to do an ad and it said he he always knew he he even knew then. Well, that's the truth. I did. So, yes, coming full circle, as you asked, was a, a joy. But, you know, if you're lucky or fortunate and I'd rather say fortunate and you and you're pursuing what you really love, what could be better? You know, what can be better? In fact, there's probably only two major things I believe matter in the world. Someone you to love and what you do. And I always say the same thing. It's only work if you don't want to do it. Wow. Uh, that's nicely said because I, I strongly feel the same way. I feel like there's, you know, the, the types of people that I like in this world are people who are passionate, that have purpose, but have a hunger for their purpose. Be, especially during these times, because I feel like a lot of young people tend to feel like they're not being listened to, they're not being, um, 
you know, they're, 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 there's no guidance for them. And, um, you know, I'm sure the same thing in your generation, you kept hearing like, they don't want, you know, they're, you're, they, my parents don't understand me and, or, you know, the kids that they, they don't work, they don't want to work. I'm sure you've heard that before, but I think it's contrary. It's contrary. And I think that right now we need to listen to each other. But like you said, um, but first and foremost, I feel like, you know, a lot of us are sad and empty inside because we don't have a purpose. We don't know what we want to do. We don't even know what we're supposed to do. So I feel like once you find out where your true purpose is and once you start to feel and see what that's about, that's when life changed for myself. Yes. Well, I think you're right. And we are both, both of us blessed that we know what we want, that we have a passion for what we want and we what we want and we're trying to pursue it. And I think that's the most important thing. But one thing I have to say, because I teach all over the world, I guess. I've yes, taught. and let's speak about that, because you've lectured all over the world. NYU, I mean, you've been everywhere. Well, I have. I, I, I went to the People's Republic of China in the 1980s, so I have been. But what I always say to young people is the same thing. Don't listen when people say to you, this is the best time of your life. It's not the best time of your life. What they mean is you don't have kids and a wife and college and mortgages. And that's true. You don't as a young person, I hope. <laughs> but but it's not the best time because you're not sure what you want to do. So I, I always try to encourage them to not worry about that and not listen to older people telling you it's the best time. I remember being told that and saying, if this is the best time, I'm not happy. This is not a great time for me. I want, you know, you're not necessarily sure what you want to do. And uh, in my case, I did know what I want to do, but how is I going to do it? I'm in the wrong coast. I don't know anyone in show business. How am I going to do it? So I hope uh, your listeners, if we have young ones, and I have a hunch with you, we do. Uh, I hope that will uh, assuage some of their concerns. Yeah, well, how did you find your purpose? Do you know when the first when, when you knew that you were born or that you were made, so to speak, to be a producer or work in this realm? Did you know that? When did no. you have like that little aha moment? You ever had that aha home, aha home moment? There's there's a very famous uh, person <laughs> for a certain group of people named Elaine May. And Elaine May and Mike Nichols were a giant comedy team, and then they both went out and became successful. Well, I was working as an executive, first at ABC, as you mentioned, then at a, a theater company, then at a television company, and then at Paramount Pictures. Yes. And, I, and at Paramount, I, it was, uh, I was very unhappy. It was the only time in my career working that I was truly unhappy. Uh, and so I had a contract. And after as a two-year contract, I asked to leave after a year and was told I can't, that they're going to convince me to stay. But at the end of the second year, I left and was quite nervous what I was going to do. I had some other offers, but I didn't, it wasn't paramount. It was the whole studio system that I didn't like, you know, the idea of perpetuating your power, knocking anybody out of the way, even if you like them to get a better parking spot or something, just stuff that I didn't like. So I went out with Elaine May and a writer named Herb Gardner. Herb Gardner wrote A Thousand Clowns and I'm Not Rappaport. He wrote a lot of things. And they took me to dinner. And I, they, what are you going to do? I said, oh, I don't know. I'm so nervous. They said, you should open up your own company. I said, oh, I, I don't know. They said, and this is a great line, Vaughn. They said, if you open up the store, we'll help you fill the shelves. Wow. So to, I like your question. That was my aha moment. If two people that are that talented are going to help, maybe I can do it. Maybe I can do it. And I did. If you open up your door, we'll help you fill it. Or your store. Yeah, we'll open you. up the door, we'll help you fill the shelves. Wow. Uh, nice. That's yeah. and, 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 and that they did. And that they did. And, it, and, and, now, it, and, and now you have this, this wonderful book out. You have this great career. Do you feel like you've accomplished everything you've wanted to accomplish? No. And if I ever feel that way, Vaughn, I'm calling you up. And saying, <laughs> Don't let this happen to me. No, right. You know, one of the things I realized, and, and I bet you feel the same way. I mean, after all, Cornell is a great, prestigious college, and you graduated from it. But 
You're not a doctor. You're not a lawyer. You're not a dentist. You're not a CPA. And neither was I. So I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn every aspect of the entertainment business. I'm going to try to learn it, read about it. And I know this much. Knowledge is power. I don't know how much power, but it'll be better because I don't have a degree. And that's what I did. That's what I did. Wow, that's so awesome. I spoke to another um, amazing human being. He were, He's a restaurateur. He's one of the, I guess, one of the more established and powerful ones in the, in the city. And um, he said the same thing. He, he didn't finish. He didn't go to college. He didn't go to college. And he's probably one of the most sought after. I mean, he has an amazing book called Be the, Be the Disruptor. And um, good title. Yes, yes. And he said exactly what you said. And actually, you what you just said resonated with myself, because I always felt the same way. Like, I love the industry. I love the, I love the I love the fact we can see the world and we get to meet the most amazing human beings. And, you know, if you really think about it, we, we you are blessed regardless. We know none of us are where, sometimes where we want to be. and We might not have all the accolades or all the money or prestige at, the, at, at a certain given time. But one thing's for sure is people can't take away the experiences of me being in a room with a Halle Berry or you being able to play games with somebody special and have a private moment with some people that people would never ever, like speaking with you, like I would never in my wildest dreams um, see this, I mean, you know, I know this moment will come, but I, I felt that for me, like as you, as you, I knew that being just a talent was not enough. I knew that for me, I wanted to utilize my entrepreneurial, um, you know, capabilities and my insight and the way that, you know, and being, you know, an inquisitive human being like yourself, I noticed that, you know, I just like to ask questions and I don't feel like you can put me in a box and listen to your conversation. I think um, a lot of people in our, in the, in the world that we grew up in and during our times, especially, um, I feel like people were always like, you can only be an actor. You can only do this. You can do that. Like it, the multi hyphenate as you are, like you're a leader, you, you're, you're, you're a pioneer in the multi hyphenate world right? You're a producer, you're a director, you're a script writer, you, you, you've seen, you do everything. You're a lecturer. Um, has anyone ever told you to focus on one thing at a time? Oh, certainly my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> but, how did that make you feel? Well, I, listen, I loved her a lot, but I also was going to do what I wanted to do. I mean, you know, there are advantages for being an only child, you know, friend of mine once said, you must have been lonely at times. I said, I never wanted a brother or a sister. Never once. I, but it turned out at the end of my parents' life, I did, because their, their old age was on my shoulders alone. But up until then, I was perfectly happy with no competition. <laughs> you know, Vaughn, there was a commercial years ago. I don't know if you remember it. Amazing that some some philosophy could come out of a commercial. This was the copy line, and I think you'll like it if you don't know it. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Oh, yes, I remember that. But where is it from? Please. Total. The commercial called for Total Cereal. Total. T -O -T -A -L, yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 um, the little dry cereal. That's right. That's right. Wow. But I, well, that's pretty good. That's a good thing to think of. Yeah, today is the first day. You know, so many people, I'm sure you had a difficult childhood. A lot of people have had that. The question is, when do you say, okay, I got to take over my life now? I can't got to stop blaming my mother, my father, my neighborhood, all the things that happened. You're still a human being. Get up and try to do something. Try. You know, if the whole key in show business, and I bet you've seen this, is to hold on to the ledge. Most people let go. Oh, I don't want to go through that. I don't want to go. Listen, I let go on acting. I said, I don't want to go through that. But I didn't want to give up show business or try, you know. And I think that's important. I, I've had people come in and you get the feeling they're young folks and they want to start as a vice president. What? <laughs> you, you, Why? It's like you got to work uh, it well. What, what do you know? <laughs> what? <laughs> I know I want to be a vice president, I guess. That's what they know. So it's a it's a it's a funny world, and I've seen in my well look I'm 81. So in my lifetime, I've seen changes that are so extraordinary, 
and I wish I felt they were for the better, but most of the time I don't. But that could be the, you know, the, the position of an older man looking back and saying, oh, it used to be better here. But in my case, I feel it did used to be better. This is a tough time for young people. Real tough. I think so, too. I think the, the strikes from Screen Actors Guild and you already know the writer strikes, those strikes were... They didn't really push the industry ahead, in my opinion. I feel like, if anything, those concessions that were made actually uh, hindered uh, the livelihoods of a lot of them. You know, I remember at one point you would do one national commercial, and you know, you can make eighty thousand to hundred thousand dollars off one commercial. Nowadays, you have to be a spokesperson, or you have to get a, you know, you 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 have to be a very special human being to get that type of money. Most of these commercials only pay like five to ten thousand dollars. Same thing with the modeling world; it's just all about. Um, you already know it's it's always been what it what it was was you know it's the whole industry is all about chasing flesh to me, but um one thing I said to myself is I just didn't want to be one dimensional and I just didn't want that and it's not who I am it's not who I am and speaking to you and others like you and and knowing that you know that I'm not the forerunner of that I'm not a pioneer of that this is something that we a lot of people feel the same way and then speaking to high you know and, and, and being in your presence as a highly successful person in the entertainment industry it's just like this is so awesome you know and I think a lot of people need to hear these stories were there any um were there any times that you triumphed it um that you felt was um one of your you know was monumental for you? Was there any monumental mo moment that, besides meeting the president of the United States of America? <laughs> there he is. You see him in the background. <laughs> president Obama, that was, right. what a wonderful thing. I actually met three presidents, but he was the most impressive by far. Uh, Which three presidents did you meet and uh, what Bill, did you- Bill, Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, and President Obama. Yeah, but I, what I wanted to say to you was that I'm interested in what are you what is what are your goals? What is it that you are wanting to do that you haven't done yet that you that you can talk about? I mean, on the air. <laughs> I mean, I would love to um, produce or EP a project that is groundbreaking and that is informative. I feel like a lot of marginalized communities don't have those type of programs, but it still has to have some sort of universality to it. I think a lot of studios and networks, they used to think of people who are marginalized to be a certain type of way. And you know what I'm saying? Of course. Unfortunately, um, nowadays, the ties have turned with the successes of Black Panther and um, a, slew other, a slew of other projects that are proven to be at the box office. But I feel like there's there's other things that can be conquered. There's things in the food and travel world that have been conquered. I still, um, there's, there's just, there's, there's some things that I, when I go places and I travel, I just came back from Germany from a 10 day press tour where I had produced it alongside with the country. And I went to four different cities and uh, spent two and three, you know, nights. And I did, I did everything from eating at amazing restaurants to going out with, you know, doing the nightlife. But it also had a very interesting component to the trip was my goal was to really find out and, you know, and to really understand sustainability and how the people of Germany are going greener and why they do it. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just feel like um, that's such a huge topic nowadays with, you know, what's going on with the ocean, um, you know, even the pollution in, in New York, you know. Um, it's just a mess. So I just feel like if we can figure out ways on how we can lower our carbon footprint or achieve carbon neutrality, I think those are things that people want to know about. And I also feel like these stories don't always need to be told by the same types of people. I feel like we constantly see the same stories told by the same types of people and it becomes more of a stereotype. So now I feel like those doors are opening slowly but surely. And I can see a future and a path but of course you know if somebody wanted to open up a store and fill my shelves yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well tell me tell me did you go to berlin was that one of the four cities yes i did and it well, melted. I tell you, oh sorry oh, excuse me yes, no i know i went to berlin and i didn't under i didn't know berlin was one of the oldest cities in the world like yes, i mean you can feel the energy from all of it and like you you know before i forget um uh, you can feel all, all the um, the USSR. You can feel the Soviet Union. You can feel all of the you know everything informed me as a human being when I when I walked down the streets and and I you know I was just I was blown away actually. 
you know, I was to a hundred years ago. The main street is Kurfürstendamm. The Kurfürstendamm is the, like the main street, and I was so naive in the in the sixties that I wanted to go to Berlin because it was a divided city, because uh, uh, there was West Berlin, which was kind of controlled by the United States, France, and England, and then there was East Berlin with Russia. And uh, so I jumped on a train happily to go to Berlin. I couldn't wait. On the way to Berlin, I realized that we're being asked to get off the train, and there are men with machine guns and police dogs and we're being lined up and we're showing our passport. And I didn't know that I thought what West Berlin was in West Germany and East Berlin was in East Germany. Turns out Berlin was right in East Germany. So I'm going through a lot of East Germany and they don't want to know who the heck you are, especially with an American passport. So that was a pretty scary uh, to start out with. But in Berlin, I had never seen nightlife like that, including, oh my God. including New York. Nothing. And they, Nothing. Had a place, they had a place called the Resi, Vaughn, R-E-S-I. I don't think it's there anymore, or maybe it is. You would go in, it was a big nightclub, and at your table, and everybody else's table, was a map of the restaurant. And there were uh, train tracks like if you had your own little locomotive at home, these were these tracks that went around the whole place. And you could open up, you have a tube at your table. And if you saw someone at table 17 and you're at 40, let's say, you write, hey, I'm at table 40. Do you want to have a drink? You'd see a lady or a guy, whatever, depending what your interests were. And you put your little note in the tube and it went around and they would look up and you'd wave and they... It was so cool, the idea that you could actually go to a club and, and try to invite someone to, you know, have a drink or whatever. I never forgot that because it was a very unusual way to have a nightclub. So now I think I have my idea for what I want to do. I want to open up a resi in New York City. <laughs> well, I'm probably, I'm probably I'm probably like one of the biggest party animals you've ever met. Trust me. Oh my God! Well, <laughs> this place this place was made for you. This was right. You. It sounds like it. <laughs> How are the party in L.A. different from New York? LA is just different. Well, now, you know, post pandemic or pre pandemic, pre pandemic, LA used to be an amazing, you know, it was amazing because you had a lot of like, you know, there's a sky bar at the Marjorie Hotel, these iconic places like One Oak. And then before there was this place called the Supper Club. And I worked with the owners and I helped them promote it as well. And we used to have magazine issues and we used to do events with uh, celebrities and, you know, you have bottle service, so it's ritzy. And then, you know, fast forward, people got a little tired of going out. Then there was something called the ghost bars, like adults only and these other bars, which are kind of cool. But everybody has the, um, these ghost bars. Even in Berlin, they have it now. So these 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 ghost bars are these bars in San Francisco, around the world, and these, you know, eclectic cities that are smart cities too. These cities, uh, they have these bars that, you know, you don't even know it's a bar. So you'll walk, you know, sometimes it'll be a panel on the wall and you'll touch the panel and you'll go through, a, you'll be like, what am I, what is going on? It's like secret patches way, just, you know, sometimes you'll go through a laundromat and it's really not a laundromat or you go through an arcade and you go downstairs, you know. So even when I went to um, Tel Aviv, that was amazing to party next to a synagogue, you know. Um, so, but I, I would say for um, the nightlife is, the nightlife in LA was, was really fun. Um, when Paris Hilton was on that show called The Simple Life, that was my that was my heyday. Um, and then fast forward, New York was always a good time because New York had these worldly clubs. So New York always had these clubs that felt like when you walked in the door, you didn't know if you're in another world or you're in another town around the world. So for me, it felt like very global. So nowadays, um, I, we still do work with a lot of promoters. New York Fashion Week has lost a little bit of its luster ever since Brian Park, in my opinion, since Mercedes Benz pulled out of Brian Park and they had it in those tents back in the day. I feel like that was the end um, for them. But I feel like now um, they differ, but I feel like it's going to be a resurgence. I feel like, you know, with this whole digital economy that we, some of us know about NFTs and blockchain, and then, you know, it's just a whole nother life. But I feel like New York is definitely going to have a resurgence. I can feel it. Um, and there's, it's very open. Um, for a club like a Resi, 
<laughs> Take that yeah. idea. You would do great with that, I bet. I think. I am. I'm taking it. I'm taking it. Yeah. And then you, and you, and you can film my, you can, you can help us produce our grand opening. All I need is 2%. <laughs> Only 2%. <laughs> All right. Or at least so dedicate, then, or at least dedicate the plaque, a little plaque on the wall. So tell, so tell me, right. have you been doing this for a long time? This this podcast. Well, I've been doing the po the podcast has been um, an extension of the magazine for about seven or eight months. Oh, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But we've been telling stories, and we've we've um, as a disruptor, I like to think we are, and I know actually I know we are. Um, we have these QR coded books that we started. So um, you basically can purchase them on barnesandnobles.com or amazon.com. And they're this eight and a half by 10 trade books. And uh, it's so cool because I remember when I modeled heavily, I loved magazines that featured me in them that have full page bleeds, right? Because you don't want a bunch of text on your face because you can't use it in your model portfolio. So what I've done is I've I learned from that world and what I loved about it. So I said to myself, what would, what can help the magazine industry come back? Because I still don't want to look at a newspaper all day. And there's people out there that love consumer touch points where I can actually, you know, hold and touch tangible items. So not only do we offer like tangible items and goods and one-offs and capsules, like cool little bikes and like Swarovski so, so uh, crystal encrusted bottles. Um, we have NFTs as well, but I wanted to be able to, um, to offer an experience that kind of merged all the worlds. So not only can you learn about us, you can actually um, see pictures in you know high resolution, colorful, you know, and take you back in that world when magazines weren't so fluffy and didn't make any sense. You know, when, you know, mag magazines to me were always entertainment. They're like these beautiful glossies, and I feel like now when, with the the publication that we're pushing out right now this new, because we've always used QR codes, which is so weird. Like, you know, like you said, when you go to Cornell, you think kind of outside the box. Um, but uh, we use these QR codes, you put them on pages with nothing else. So you, you either know who this person is or you don't. And they work in the tablet edition as well on um, Amazon. I mean, on uh, Apple or Google Play under 360 Magazine um, app. But you just scan it and it goes to the website in real time. As a publisher, that's great for me. Why? Because I don't, if I have to retract a word or if I misspelled your name, right? Schlosberg, I call you Slowyberg or something. I don't that have to. Would, that would be better than most people do, but thank <laughs> you. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have to go back and like, I don't have to go back and basically have to uh, retract the entire story. I can do it in seconds, right? Because all you have is a QR code on the picture. So I can control the pages are being controlled on the website. So I figured out how to merge the two. Um, I feel like right now the world we live in is going to be disrupted again because we're going to an evolution as human beings and homo space, you know, homo sapiens. And I feel like, you know, TikTok is my favorite platform. At first, I didn't understand it, but I have a son and he taught me about TikTok over the last five years. He's from seven to he's about 12, about to be 13 now. He's like, you had, he, he told me all the ins and outs. So once you start to understand how those algorithms work and why they work and all this other stuff, it's it's become, I, I've loved TikTok, um, especially because I feel like TikTok is where a lot of people like myself, especially young people, they're getting the news from TikTok. And I think it's so sad that we live in a day and age where I can't turn on the television without hearing the opinion, as you said, as you stated before, I want to hear the report. I have enough cognitive sense that I can break this down on my own accord and I can understand what you're talking about. So just give me the facts. I don't need you to tell me that you don't like this person or you detest this person. I can let me let me make that decision up for myself. So now I think right now we're in a situation where people are a lot more intelligent than than people think that, that we are. But we also are in a situation where these cable news stations are becoming like they're, they're it's like watching a talk show, right? Like I'm, I'm not really getting information and I'm not, and I'm getting your opinion about somebody that I can derive my own opinion from if you just give me the facts. It's true. And one of the things I've noticed also in magazines, Vaughn, is that a lot of them have decided they better make the story short. They better not let it yes. keep going. Now, USA Today were the first to come up with that concept of let's just give the people a short synopsis and let them decide what the facts are, but we'll give you the facts that we know are true. We don't know the facts now. I don't know. It's very sad. We just do not know. 
Uh, and that's a very sad situation for any country to be in, but especially the one that we live in. That, you, you, know, it, you know, it's just, there's such false news going on. And as you say, people telling their opinion, which unfortunately other people take as fact. And it's not fact. It's that it's their opinion, and then we find out it's not even their opinion. It's not exactly. It was paid for. And That's another right. thing is, is that um, a lot of uh, young people, um, or people who are just youthful at heart, like ourselves, we, um, you know, we have ADHD. I, you know, my mind moves a, a mile a minute. So for me, you know, what I like about what we're doing as well is these QR codes not only connect to the pages. So in the magazine that you see before you in the print edition, and I'll, I can pull one out and show you. Um, they're they're shorter than the average magazine. I've had I've I've produced magazines in the last fourteen years of my life with three hundred and sixty that have been that have been four hundred pages, no, and then now really? now yeah. yes yes a compendium. So now we're down to fifty two or fifty yeah. pages. Yeah. And and the great thing is it's all about the artwork. So I want to take it back when you have the publishers like myself who actually take pictures and I know how to operate a camera and I know about lighting and. You know, I know how to video and I know how to do, you know, I know how to speak and I know how to crack a joke and I, and I can cook. I, I'm, you know, I'm real good. But my point to you is that what's so cool about it is if you don't want to read our short story, because we're very informative, we're not a lot of fluff, like you said, a lot of people in our demographic, they don't want to read fluff. Like, you know, you open up time, sometimes the first paragraph is about the writer. I really don't care about your day and how the room faded to black and then you saw Beyonce. I want you to tell me, when, when was she born? Where is she at? You know, I need information. So right. the thing is for us is if you don't want to read, then you can listen to our conversation. So everything presented in the magazine is completely different than what's presented on the website. And then also people have an, an opportunity to, if you, if you don't want to read at all, you can listen to us. Isn't that great? No one else is doing it. Well, I wanted to ask you because you obviously are involved with young people and and I'm not because I, I guess I'm considered way beyond the age. <laughs> but what I wanted to know, uh, uh, do they see, it appears to me, Vaughn, because I, I would never say it as a fact. I'm not one of those guys, but it appears to me that young people don't seem to, I'm not, not every young person, but young people don't seem to care about anything that happened before they were born. Is that fair? Am I being unfair? I don't think I don't think you're being unfair. I just think it's not properly presented. I think for me, I've been blessed by having a Gen Z child. So when you have a child that's younger than you that can put you on, I feel like I'm so blessed because he really is one of those cool kids. He dresses nice. He, you know, it's just like it's like it's just amazing. So it's like he he gets all A's um, when he does. Uh, you know, when he does, you know, commit himself to his studies and he's very athletic and he dances and he's silly once he gets to know you and he's entertaining. But what I found is when I listen to him, um, I find that the way we lecture and teach things nowadays is not is not a, is not adapting to today's standards or what young people want to hear or how they want to hear it. So it's kind of like, I feel like our approach needs to change and it needs to be more inclusivity. There's not enough transparency. So kids can see right through the BS, you know what I'm saying? I and um, and, and they have, you had to remember, you, you grew up with the radio. I grew up with a pager and a beeper. I had, you know what I'm saying? I had a SkyTel, I had a, a cell phone and they're growing up with the internet in their hands like these are actual computers like i'm i don't even, i don't even i don't even use paper every every computer or cell phone i have is a samsung and it has a stylus so i'm actually taking notes of, or during our conversation with a stylus so the thing is is like you can either fight technology or you can adapt to it and i feel like a lot of the schools in particular <sighs> I don't want to say, but some of the, even some of the major institutions in America, they're not teaching kids anything. And if, you know, I teach so many young people from so many different colleges, and I just can't believe that they're not even learning, learning the fundamentals of social media, not to mention the fundamentals of how to just do research. Like, I'm like, are you serious? You really asked me a question about punctuation inside of quotations. We all know that's, you know, it's up to the publication. Every, every publication has their own you know, uh, style and language, right? And then also, you know, this is not the proper Queen's English. We're, we're American. And so American journalists, we normally do it, you know, the, what I said, the aforementioned. So my point to you is that it's a lot of little things that 
they don't take um I don't think that they don't take, they don't do, they don't do it on purpose. They also, they're not taught. They're not taught to be cognitive. So when, when my son is, he'll say, I want to go to Princeton. I want to go here. And I'll say, well, you know, have you ever read about, have you ever read a dictionary? So my uncle had an old dictionary from Webster's, a collegiate version. So I gave it to my son and he, and he's been reading it and he, he put it down. I've read a whole dictionary from front to back and it changed my vocabulary tremendously. I noticed, I noticed that he read some of it and we had a conversation and I said, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was using <laughs> verbs and adjectives and talking about the hypotenuse and, you know, this is 11. So I feel like if you stimulate a young person or just ask them questions and, 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 and engage in with them, opposed to lecturing at them, it's a different approach. And I feel like that's what that's what's needed. Um, these You're young people, basically saying is that it's not being encouraged. It's not being encouraged. Things. I don't think it's, it's not being encouraged. And I know it for a fact. And also we need some sort of um, mental health services in our school system. I feel like all the young people, every single intern, because I'm so, um, you already know, like I mean, we've talked about so many different things because we have that accessibility, right? We're, that's what people like us. And, um, and I feel like a lot of young people in our program, because I've taught kids in my program from Stanford, um, all over, Emerson, tons of them. And a lot of my students, I don't, I don't have a master's, but a lot of my students have a master's degrees, um, students as well. And because, and I think what it is, is because the school system isn't teaching them to think outside of the box. It's not encouraging them. It's teaching them the same textbook. Whatever we're doing right now is not working. And I feel like expelling our young people, particularly for, for to make kids go to college and spend $150,000 and not be able to come out with a job is utterly ridiculous. Crazy. The prices, the, what it costs to send a child to school is obscene. It really obscene. is. One of the things I hope you'll do now that we've been friends for at least an hour is, <laughs> is that you really should do a documentary uh, that you should produce, I think, on the sit situations the way you see it. And it could have not just about schools, but it could have about the carbon imprint. It could have about the environment problems. It could have, it could all be in one show where you would talk in terms of what can we do? What can we do to change? So I hope you do it. And if you do, I'll pay whatever it is to see it, as long as it's less than $20. No, no, it's, it's going to be it's gonna be like Resi. <laughs> <laughs> the Resi will pay for it. The Resi right. will pay for it. So is there anything else that we didn't touch on um, that you wanted to speak about? Any community involvement that you wanted us to know about? Well, I guess the big thing for me is people have said, why did you write the book? And I wrote the book certainly to get, I had nothing much to do with the pandemic. So that was number one. But I also wrote it because I wanted young people who seem to think it's all glamour and glitz show business to see that it's very far from that. I mean, there's certainly a lot of excitement and there's certainly some glamour, but it's hard work. And I wanted them to see that even if you have the money, or even if you have the talent that are willing to do it, things can go awry, as I'm sure you've seen in your own life. So I wanted to write a book. And the reason I called it Try Not to Hold It Against Me, I was going to be talking about people that some people have uh, problems with, you know, whether it be uh, uh, Woody Allen or Aaliyah Kazan, or in my case, I had this kid who is a rock and roll promoter from Buffalo. And if there were six shows that the Rolling Stones or Sinatra were going to do in America, they would choose him as one of the six. He was that good a promoter in the Buffalo, Canada area. And he came to me. I never heard of him. He came to me to learn the movie business. And I sat him down and I said, all right, you bring in a legal size pad and sit across from me and you can listen on the other phone and take notes. And when I hang up, ask me questions and I'll teach you the movie business. And he was smart. He was funny. He was engaging. And he turned out to be Harvey Weinstein. So, you wow. know, it's a funny, funny world. Now, and never in my wildest dreams, Vaughn, did I think he would hit the heights he hit, let alone, sadly, the depths that he sunk to. But uh, it was an interesting time because he was from the hood like I was. I mean, you know, we were guys from, he was from Queens, I was from the Bronx, and uh, 
he had taste, he had knowledge, and I never saw him treat anybody badly uh, until he did once with a friend of mine, and that was the end of our relationship because that wasn't fair, I felt. So, you know, it's been a it's been a, an interesting ride. And when I wrote the book, Try Not to Hold It Against Me, um, it had to do with how I got the title. Well, actually, my agent got the title. I always wanted an agent, Vaughn. <laughs> All my life, everybody would talk to me about their agents. I always wanted an agent. Well, she did the great thing. She came, hey, there's a paragraph story in your thing where you call Burt Reynolds, and you don't know Burt Reynolds, and you leave him a message. So... And I left a message saying, hi, Bert, my name is Julian Schlossberg. I'm a New York City producer. Try not to hold it against me. So <laughs> she said, hey, that's a good title for your book. I said, you know, it may be. And that's how the title came. But, it, but as you said earlier, you know, we both came from big cities. We both came from not much money. And we both had a dream, a dreams. I'll put a plural on it. We both had dreams. I've pretty much fulfilled many of mine. You've only just begun, my man. I'm telling you, you've just begun. I, I, if you were a, if you were a stock, I'd buy you right now. <laughs> well, you, well, you know, I am for sale. No, <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you came to New York. <laughs> right. You already know New York. You, you sell anything on any corner out here. It's crazy. <laughs> but I love New York for that energy. I love it. I missed it. Um, and I'm the pandemic. I looked at the that. Um, I guess for me, the pandemic brought me back here because I. But I've been going back and forth. But um, right now, I'm like I, I kind of love New York because I miss being on the streets and just like seeing the people and the hustle and bustle of it. I just love oh, that yeah. energy. I feel like there's no other energy um, besides oh. Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I was in. Uh... I was in Frankfurt when they have, I didn't know it again, like the Berlin story. They had a big book fair, couldn't find a hotel, unable to book a hotel. So I'm sleeping on the train station when in the middle of the night I'm being poked and I get up and the Frankfurt police are there saying, what are you doing? And in my best German, was, was, was. Anyhow, I said, I, I, uh, I need a place to sleep. They said, you can't sleep here. I said, put me in jail. They said, what? I said, put me in jail. There'll be a bed. There'll be, I'll have a bathroom. <laughs> but they didn't do it. They just made me right. get and leave. But that and was- you have, And you have health insurance all covered. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I'll tell you about LA for me. You know, I was bi-coastal for many years and uh, I found LA the strangest city I've ever visited. I'll give you one example. As you may know, the Beverly Wilshire has a, a new wing and an old wing. And in between is the, is the garage. You put your car down there. They bring it up. I have a vice. I'm having lunch with some vice president of Columbia Pictures. And we go outside and we're waiting for our car. And he says to me, it's a loner. I, I said, what? Excuse me? It's a loner. I said, what? What do you mean? He says, the car, my car's a Mercedes. He said, but it's in the shop. And the car they gave me is a Chevy, but that's a loner. That's not my car. And I think to myself, I don't know what to say to this one. What's my answer? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. It was very hard to keep my head around stuff like that, you know. And the, the importance of, a, of the home, of the pools, of the tennis courts, of all that stuff was not only not for me, but I was even afraid because I thought it was very tempting. It wasn't that I was above it. I thought to myself, this is a very strong undertow. And I could see myself being sucked right into it. So I would run back to New York City. <laughs> it, was a, it was a strange town for me. Well, this is yeah. many, many years ago. I'll no, it's still, it still is strange, but it's it's changing a little bit. Not to cut you off, but I love the Beverly Wilshire. I actually um, did a story on the Beverly Wilshire, and they put me in the same suite as Pretty Woman. Ah, uh -huh. was <laughs> her, is Hernando caught right alive? Who owned it? Is he I'm alive? Sure. I think the Four Seasons. Um, I, I work. We work with them, so they. Um, I think their their brand their brand is in charge of the management right now. So I'm oh, not quite geez. sure, but it's beautiful. Like you said, it's like an old side of it, and then they renovated it, and it's like whoa. So it's like it's like it's like where am I? So it's a gorgeous hotel, and you know the rooms are magnificent because well, I only would stay in the old 
old place because I love the old suites and they were so yeah big. they're big right yeah. big and beautiful and beautifully furnished and yes it was, and beautiful it was, and beautiful it balconies nice. yeah it's a it's a it's an interesting city uh yeah. I remember because I'm new from New York and you'll get a kick out of this I think I uh decided to take a walk up Rodeo Drive one night uh just to look at the store windows and I all of a sudden the <laughs> cops come they shine the light on me. What are you doing? I said, I'm from New York. I'm walking. And they fell over laughing. That really made them laugh. <laughs> right, because nobody in LA walks. But now we have so many bike trails and everything out there. So it's been cool. Um, people are biking and getting out more. And then, you know, the, like I said before, you, the pandemic has reset the world. We all are, you know, either working in close proximity or to, to our homes. So it's kind of cool. But yeah, it's, like, it's a different world. You, you, where are you without? You're in New York, right? Yeah, yeah, I live in a town called Katona. It's upstate New York. It's, oh, okay. It's about an hour away. I lived most of my life in Manhattan and the Bronx. Uh, brought right. up in the Bronx and lived in Manhattan. And uh, but uh, you know, it's a uh, it's an interesting kind of time to see the changes that are going on now. And that's why I I'm very interested in talking to you because I'm kind of a uh, an ostrich these days my head's in the <laughs> sand but you're out there you're doing it and uh you're you helped me today in letting me understand some of the things that's going on where you where you're the world-renowned lecturer well <laughs> at least in my own head <laughs> yeah how did you get involved in that people were just i mean they, they uh, it was like career day people were like bring them on in for career day <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think what happened was because I had the radio show for right. nine years, I became somewhat, really a little, somewhat known. Um, uh, but what was amazing to me was, as you said earlier about Halle Berry or whatever, here I'm sitting with Bob Hope and George Burns and Jack Nicholson and Dustin Hoffman, and I'm thinking, how did this happen? <laughs> this this was a a dream that that came true because my show was on from eight to midnight so it was a lot of hours to uh fill but what was good about it Vaughn was the fact that you had call-ins the public could call in of course some of that wasn't so good but some of it was good wow well Julian you truly are uh a blessing to say the least um because you know it's been a very trying time for a lot of us and just to hear someone who is so well established and successful you know give out praise to myself and also just um it's just amazing but also just to be able to hear your stories and you know in you know, like you said like in hollywood like sometimes you, you you'll wake up and it feels like a regular day next thing i know i'm like in front of x y and z and it's like you like, and, and sometimes i have conversations with some of our team members and, and i'm like i was talking to x y and z and i was at the you know behind the stage but you know to me it felt like a regular day but like you said it's it's, it's not it's it was, and it wasn't <laughs> today is the first day of the rest of your life about exactly <laughs> total serial <laughs> <laughs> but is there is there any other like word of encouragement or advice considering um we all we could all use it um that you could let us in on or anything you want to leave us with because you dropped us a couple other gems but if you have any other um life lessons that you um that you've learned from well i think i do write about it in the book uh, I, I have a whole group of things that I say that I've learned at all these years. But another thing I would like to share with you and with the listeners is the fact that if you really believe in it, as I said earlier, if you really want it bad enough, you can get it. But you have to have stick to itiveness. You have to not be willing to let go of the ledge because it's hard, whatever it is you want to do, but it can be done. One of the amazing things about the United States and all of us could list what's not so great. But one of the amazing things is in almost every country in the world, there's a strict caste system. In this country, both of us started out pretty poor, and we're going to be okay financially the rest of our lives. In most countries, you start out poor, you remain poor. So the idea is, remember, if you have something you believe in, fight for it, hold on to the ledge, but understand that your personal life at the beginning is going to suffer. 
because if you, you you can't do both at the same time, you can't be a great mate and also be trying to make a career of yourself. It's very, very hard, very hard. So uh, if I'm elected, <laughs> anyhow, it's about, we, may, we may need you. It's a lot <laughs> I got to tell you, Vaughn, it was a real pleasure talking to you. It, it was. was a pleasure as well. And I want you to have a wonderful weekend. You really made my day, honestly. And I'm so glad that we were able to have this discuss this, this discussion. And I can't believe how like chill you are. Like, I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> well, like, well, but you're from the Bronx. You're from the Bronx. <laughs> so it makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> All I want to say to you is this. Every once in a while, you may get stuck and you need a guest. Call me. Oh, uh-uh. I'm calling you every week, every Friday at 2 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you have a great Thanks, day. Tana. It was I a hope, pleasure being with you. And give, you, give your son my regards. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Julian. Okay. Bye-bye, bye, Vaughn. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.